Hi everyone, welcome to the demonstration of the Single Cell Explorer, a new open source tool developed by the Computational Biology Group at Beringer Ingelheim to provide scientists with a user-friendly and collaborative environment to analyze single cell RNA-seq data. For much more detail about the technical aspects of the tool, please be sure to check out the recent paper by Dee Fang. Now Single Cell Explorer is browser-based, so I'm going to start off by opening Chrome and navigating to the site for demo installation. I wind up here on a landing page that provides me with lists of some of the studies that have already been loaded. These are organized by species. As you can see, there are different options. So if I click through to this uh, collection of blood studies, you can see here that there's actually different studies and they're also separated by the type of representation that are being used. So here we've got a UMAP version of this PBMC data and here's a TSNE version. Now, what you can do here, I'm gonna actually go up here and select this study from the Bader Lab, which is based on the human liver. I can jump directly to the map by clicking on this blue button. You can also edit the metadata for the study by clicking on the edit button, if you'd like to change around the name or some of the other, other attributes of this study. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm gonna go right to the map itself by clicking this button. Now that will open up this interface. Here you'll see a TSNE map. This is probably familiar to most folks who have, have done uh, single cell analysis, used the SIRAT package or something similar like ScanPy. And what you're seeing here is that each cell is represented by an individual dot colored by the cluster ID. So that similar cells tend to be in similar clusters in this representation. And here they're also annotated. In this case, we've got NK cells, different hepatocyte clusters and similar things. This directly gives you an overview of the different kinds of cells in your experiment. Now, if I'm interested in looking for a particular gene, I can actually go over to this box and then type it in. So here I'm gonna start with a hepatocyte specific transporter. That's SLC22A1. So I just punch that in, click search. And you'll see that fairly quickly, we get an update of this, this view here to color the cells that are positive for expression of that gene. In this case, it actually lines up pretty well with our biological interpretation. We're getting good expression in this hepatocyte cluster, as well as this one and this one. You'll also note that to the right, you're getting some information in graph format about the overall expression of this marker. So you'll get the positive cells here. This is a percent by the different clusters. So you can see again, good representation in the hepatocytes. And then you also get a measure of normalized counts. So this, this first one will show you how many cells in the cluster express it as a proportion. The second is showing you a little bit more about how much expression there is in the cells that express it. Now, this search up here is actually a little bit adaptive in terms of the, the kinds of views that you get depend on the number of genes that you punch in. So if I extend this a little bit farther, so say I punch in um, another marker gene, this would be for T cells and other immune cells, I'm going for CD4, put both of those in and now I click search. And rather than getting those graphs now and the single color, I get this updated view that has um, different colors depending on whether the cells are single or du double positive. So you can see as before, most of the hepatocytes tend to just have that transporter. And then you get more CD4 expression in some macrophages and T cells. There are a small number of double positive cells as well, which are, are denoted by these yellow dots. And if I look over here, I get an image now, which is sort of reminiscent of flow cytometry data, where I have one marker on one axis, one on the other, and then some, some overall view of the relative proportion of these things. Now, if I want to do a multi-gene query, I can actually keep adding additional markers. So say I wanna punch in something like uh, some interleukins. I'll go for IL-6, IL-12, maybe throw in an MMP or two. And P1 and 2. Now if I click search here, it's getting challenging for it to, do, to display that many categorical variables. So what you see instead is you'll see this table, which now will have one gene in this table. So I can now click through and very quickly, if I have a list of genes that I'd like to look through, I can quickly go from one to the next and see them all visualized on this map. Now, if I were to click on this uh, grid view here, this will actually change the view from a map to a heat map. So now I can very quickly look at numbers of genes uh, one next to the other in this heat map view 
and then see a representation of which clusters are expressing my different markers. So that gives you an overview of how you, you would like to go through and explore the data and see where your gene expression is for your different cl clusters through the gene profile view. Now, of course, not everything is based on individual genes or even panels of genes. Sometimes you're interested in a broader view of what makes the cell clusters distinct. So in this case, you can see that the map is already annotated with some, some annotations, uh, T cells, macrophages, hepatocytes, and so forth. But the data didn't come from the output of the machine this way. These were annotated by a human curator. So one thing that I really like about Single Spl Explor Cell Explorer is how easy it makes this annotation and curation process. Now, to do this, we're going to move from the Gene Profiles to the Cell Subsets tab. So I'll click on this. And now you can see uh, we're, we're seeing not just the cell types themselves, but also the relevant markers that have been annotated as being diagnostic for these different clusters. Now you can do different things. You can color the map by different parameters. So here we have it colored by the cluster ID, which is a, a logical default, but you can also cl color it by other things. So for example, here we've got a metric of cell phase, which is uh, a, a measure of where uh, these cells are in their cell cycle. This is calculated from a gene and gene panel, and you can see now that the cells are colored appropriately by that piece of metadata. If you would also like to uh, narrow things down a little bit, you can filter to include or exclude certain clusters or different annotations. So here, for example, I just want to view the cells from that are in the S phase of cell cycle. Or, for example, I could go back and color by that original cell type. And then I can hide different clusters. So say I don't want to have the hepatocytes colored in this, uh, in this cell map. So I can either uncheck them there, and that will hide or unhide the coloring. So that lets you very quickly focus on and have your eye drawn to the clusters that are of most interest for you. Now, if you don't have these cells annotated uh, and you wouldn't for a new experiment, then really Single Cell Explorer can make this, this complicated work a little bit more interesting and interactive. So one thing that we'll need to do here, in this case, see we have a larger macrophage cluster, but the original authors actually pointed out that there are two subsets of macrophages at the different ends of this larger cluster that are somewhat distinct. So here we're going to start to try to figure out what this, this darker green cluster actually represents. Now the way that we'll do this is by using a selection tool. So I just drag my cursor over here, and now I can draw on this map to select the cluster of interest. Now the selection tool in Single Cell Explorer has a lot of advantages being this freehand selection tool. As you can imagine, the clusters here that we see are somewhat irregularly shaped as the output of TSNI. So if we had something that was just a rectangular selection, it could be really tricky to navigate and to select certain subclusters that might be of interest. This freehand selection tool really gets around that and is, I think, a strong advantage of the system. Once I've selected this cluster of interest, then I can t start to figure out what's distinctive about it. So I have this selection made. It will tell me that I've selected about 535 cells. And now I can click this contrast button. This will compare this cluster to all the other cells in the experiment and try to find lists of genes that most distinguish this cluster from the rest of the cells. Now, this will take a little bit of time to compute, so we can see our contrast results um, humming along here to let us know that the calculation is proceeding, and we'll just wait for this result to finish. All right, so that's finished calculating. That's been about maybe 30 seconds to a minute, and now we can see that we've got these tables of positive and negative genes. Now, just as in the table before, you can select the individual genes and sort of go through and just kind of quality control to see how these are actually behaving as markers. So you can see that there's considerable variability. Some of these do quite well at distinguishing macrophages from the rest of the population, but they may not be so distinctive for the top versus the bottom. So this one, you can see this complement is actually starting to separate the, this very top of the cluster from the bottom. So I'm going to check this box. That's um, because I think that marker is kind of, kind of good and maybe should go forward. Very similar pattern for this other complement. Uh, Marco, I think, was also mentioned in the original paper, and you can see that's quite distinct for the lower group of macrophages. So I'm going to throw that in as well. Now, 
these are the, the genes that tend to be more associated with this cluster and have increased expression versus the others. These negative genes tend to be not expressed in that cluster. So you can see here, these seem to be more hepatocyte, but less in the macrophages. In this case, I'm really just gonna focus on the positive markers, but I just wanted to let you know that you do have the option to do both of these if one is more diagnostic for your case. Now, as I'm adding these, I'm just gonna scroll down in the browser. You can see my positive marker genes are now associated with this, and I can say that I'd like to save this cluster once I think I've got all the marker genes that I'd like to include. Now, this gives you another option to add some of your annotations. So you have your positive marker genes, your negative marker genes, which were brought in automatically. You can add a comment. So I think in the original paper, these were thought to be more uh, anti-inflammatory macrophages. So I'll say something like anti-inflammatory max in original paper and I can name them something. So we actually have some nice controlled vocabulary here which can really uh, help you if you're finding the same cell types over and over again, you can refer to them in a common way. If you don't find the one that you're interested in, you can actually add something. So I can say anti-inflammatory MAC. And then I have the option to add that. And now that'll be part of the controlled vocabulary that folks can see in the future. So I click save here. And now we've actually added that as a distinct cluster. All right, now if I'm back at the overall cell subsets, you can actually see that at the bottom now we have anti-inflammatory MAC as its own labeled cluster in our list. And if we wanna actually add a label to the map, we can do that as well. So we can just go here, we've selected anti-inflammatory MAC, and now click select label. And you'll just get this little crosshair where you can decide where you'd like to drop it. So I'll plop that right on top of the cluster, click the green check, and now this is actually part of the overall annotation that other people can see. So this provides you with a really nice way to start to go through and label your clusters. And again, because it's web-based and because people can work with controlled vocabularies and all work from the same map, it can really provide a good way to do this collaboratively so that somebody who is more of an expert in macrophages can use their favorite markers and really make sure everything makes sense and the liver biologists can focus on other things like the hepatocyte clusters. Okay, so I'm gonna show one last feature here, which is, I would say, a little bit more experimental, but very exciting. So what I demonstrated so far was still a very manual, hands-on approach to curating the cell clusters, where you're really looking for differential clusters, differential genes, and then deciding which are the most important ones based on your past knowledge. But another option, if you go to these three dots here, would be to do more of a machine learning approach based on neural networks. So here the idea is that the neural net is trained with cluster assignments in other data sets. And this builds up a model where when it sees a new cell type, it can say, uh, it can assign the cell type identifier based on how it has been trained from previous clusters. So using this is, is quite simple. You just click neural net production, and then you have the option to select from the different training models that have gone into this. So in this case, um, there are only two, but of course more can be added. I'm gonna click cell type, and then I just clicked predict. Now this is going to go through and calculate a little bit based on this, this trained model, and then it will come back and assign its best guess for the cell clusters. So I'm gonna unselect that just so we got that clear. And now what you can see is that it's, it's starting to take guesses about what these cell types are based on the on prior knowledge. Now, because this has not been trained with a highly relevant li liver data set, it's not really going to pick up everything. But as a first guess, it does a very nice job. So you can see the T cell cluster is clearly identified. The macrophage cluster is clearly labeled as myeloid lineage, which is quite good. And something I thought was quite interesting is that the uh, hepatocytes are actually fairly well labeled in some groups as being epithelial cells. Now, hepatocytes are epithelial origin, so this is actually kind of pointing to some co interesting conservation, even though we're, we're going outside of, of, of a highly related data set um, from the model. So I would say that even if you don't have an initial, uh, a, a, a well-trained neural net on a very highly corresponding data set, it's worth making, uh, making a prediction from this neural net just to see what you're getting 
and it can definitely help you to annotate uh, early on some very distinct cell types that may be well trained from, for example, PBMC data, such as the B cells, plasma cells, and T cells. So this is, this is really an overview of the major functions that you would be using for Single Cell Explorer. I really hope that you check it out and find it useful for your own research. We've certainly found it to be very helpful for our single cell, cell data sets at Beringer Ingelheim, uh, both in terms of improving the quality of our annotations, but also making our data much more accessible. So thanks very much for your time, and I wish you the best of luck with your research.